Thank you, praise team. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Let, Let us, us rejoice, rejoice and be, be glad in it, especially if you like storms. <laughs> Please have a seat. I mean, I'm serious. From the time coming in, as Stephen says, uh, boy, I love storms, you know, and I love stormy days. I do, too, because it reminds me of the natural knowledge of God. Who can say there is no God when you have storms like that out, out there? But you know what's really good for us is we know who that God is because we open up the Bible and see he's not just a God of judgment but God of love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, it's really cool. One last thing I want to say. I got to visit the... <laughs> I didn't tell you this. I got to visit the In the World Bible Study, and Pastor Mann was uh, talking about singing. He says, well, if I were to sing, and all of a sudden, kaboom! <laughs> I don't think God wants you to. Anyway. <laughs> That's funny. Um, <laughs> you know, people, I wanna, it's yeah. a trickle one. You know, people will gradually get it. Yeah. I want to thank all of you so much for uh, supporting our youth as we're collecting funds to go to the National Youth Gathering this coming July. Um, we are almost there. We still need your help. Uh, we are having a fundraiser this Thursday evening. Well, actually, it's all day. It's from 11 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Right. You need to grab one of these on the way out. If you can come out, uh, show this to the people at the register, and they will donate 50% back to the youth program. So the more people we can get to come out, hand them out to your neighbors, to uh, people you work with, it would just be an awesome night. To Pieology. Pieology. Pizza pie. It's good stuff. You get yeah. your own thin crust. Make it how you want it. It's good stuff. And they're on the back. 
uh, in, the, right. in the worship center. How you doing with, with funds? Like, like last night at Follow the Star, uh, we had a bunch of servers. That yeah, got we had about tipped. 12 or 13 servers, and we yeah. made over $600 in tips. So, yeah. Praise, Praise God, God for that. Thank so you. How close, how close are we to getting all we need? We're close. So I'd say we're about $2,500. $2,500. Yeah, left to raise. raise your hand if you got $2,500 for the youth. For the <laughs> Can we raise the lights? No, Think about it. Take some time to pray about it. I just do want to talk about Father Star. Last night was such an incredible night. How many of you were there last night? Thank you so much. Thank you for, to all of the leadership teams that were there. It just made it a great, great evening. And um, um, I really liked it. I really liked the, the beautiful puppy. Um, and her name is now Precious. <laughs> and Heidi Ventavania, Heidi Ventavania is the one who won her, made a lifetime commitment to her. Um, is uh, Angie uh, uh, Wilson is the one who was the vet who made sure she was super healthy and uh, Heidi is going to be working with her. I'm just really excited about that. That was our first time doing that, and it was, it was really good. I want to let you know that overall, um, we took in almost $30,000 last night, which means, yeah, I mean, it, it means God does want it to continue another year, all right? So we're going we're gonna to do at least one more year, and uh, it's, it's pretty cool because I know more is going to be coming in as, as well. Uh, there's also, uh, just to let you know, Holy Week is coming up. And uh, the, during that week, Thursday is Monday, Thursday. If you have not been to our Monday, Thursday service, you are going to want to check it out. All the services on, during Holy Week, Monday, Thursday is the commandment to love, all right? At 7 p.m. Yeah, at 7 p.m. And it's, it's going to be here. It's, a, it's a, going to be a great worship experience. Our, our uh, confirmation kids are going to take their first communion. Uh, but just as important as that is it's just a night to witness that last step almost in the journey that Jesus Christ took to the cross. That was the night of his betrayal, all right? And um, we symbolize that by stripping the altar and all that's up here and just leaving it bare to symbolize everybody deserting Jesus. And um, anyway, it, it's going to be a great Thursday night to, to walk out from here just recognizing what Jesus went through. And then Friday, Good Friday, uh, it, that is a great service. It's called a Tenebrae Service of Darkness. And again, if you haven't experienced that, you're going to want to be here for that as well. And then Easter Sunday, of course, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus as we always do. And so we praise God for that as, as well. That week, during Holy Week, there will not be any D3 Wednesday night. Right. Uh, so please mark that on your calendar. No D3 on the, the week of Holy Week. All right. Well, that's all I got. How about you? Anything that's else? Let's worship. All right. Let's worship. Let's all stand. We have a new song to teach you today. It's called God My Rock. And uh, this song is going to feature our very own Justin. I'm going to be a country superstar, Acuff. <laughs> and but first, we're going to teach you the chorus to this song. And can we call up the words to the second time we sing the chorus? Starting with, you are the strength of my heart. It goes like this. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely. got it? Sure you do. We have faith in you. We're going to try it from the very beginning. Justin, set the tone for us. Oh, 
to believe You have not let go of me God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock Carry through the darkest storms You will heal me in your arms God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock In the blessing of the pain Father, I thank you for bringing us here to worship today, and that song reminds me of a psalm where it says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and my salvation, my stronghold, and I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised because I am saved from my enemies. God, that is how we remind ourselves this morning of your presence here with us and through the waters of holy baptism where you call us your kids. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. It's a great song to remind us when things get tough that God is our rock. Aren't you so happy you have a God that you can go to when things get rough in life? Because it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen. And it's so important for us to remember that he is there for us, and that he wants us to come to him and trust in him and trust the promises that he's made for us. So like every week, we come here to this place to acknowledge our need for God. And right now, we do so by confessing our sins to the Lord and trusting in his promise to forgive us. So I ask that you take a posture of humility before the Lord as we go before him and confess every sin. God, you are our salvation. You have done everything for us required to inherit eternal life, and that is such a precious gift. I thank you for it. I thank you for giving us the gift of faith. But God, we know that in this world that we mess up, we don't live up to the calling that you have given us to be a light to this community, to the people that you place in our lives, starting with our family, God. Sometimes we let the words of our, our mouth get the best of us. 
Sometimes our actions are not pleasing in your sight. And for these sins, God, and for all the ones that even we don't know, we come to say that we're sorry and ask for your grace and your mercy. So God, we come before you right now, trusting in your promise as we lay all of our sins at the foot of the cross. You know, our gracious Heavenly Father, He gives us a promise that when we confess our sins to Him, He is always faithful to forgive us. But that doesn't make this life any easier. It, it makes our recognition of our dependence on needing a Savior more significant and important in our lives. But life is difficult, and that's why God not only gives us a promise to forgive us, but to nourish us and strengthen us and assure us of that forgiveness every single day of our lives. And that's why on the very night of the betrayal of Jesus Christ, right before he went to that cross, after the meal they were having, the Passover meal, he took the bread. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. As you eat of this, remember me. And in the very same manner, he took the cup after supper. And again, after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. As often as you drink of this, also do so, remembering me. It's always a good reminder for us to know what remembering means. Jesus is saying, remember me in the sense of live your life for me. Remember all I'm about to do for you, all I've done for you, all God has given you. And live your life saying thank you to God. Well, in doing so, that begins with knowing that you have nothing to fear because you know who God is. We might hear the storms outside and hear that thunder crack and see that lightning. We might be afraid of that in a sense, but we know that our God loves us and cares for us. And though he's the creator of all that is and names every lightning bolt, <laughs> he gives him a name. <laughs> he knows it. But he also knows every hair in your head, every word you speak before it's even out of your mouth. And you know what? He loves me and you anyway. That's who our God is. So he makes that promise to forgive us when we confess our sins. So know this, that based upon your confession, the promise of God and the work of Jesus Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection, all of your sins, no matter how big they've been, no matter how many times you've done them, no matter what about them, all of your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what God is wanting to do now is for you to receive his presence in this meal, just as Jesus said. His presence is in the bread and the wine. And receive it as assurance and the strength that we all need to continue our walk as disciples of Jesus in this life. If you are here today and you believe that you need what Jesus earned on that cross, and that's forgiveness. If you believe that Jesus is your Savior, that what he did on that cross counts for you. If you believe that in some mysterious way he's present in this meal because he says so. And if you are here today wanting to become a stronger disciple of Jesus Christ for the sake of the world, then the Lord invites you to receive him today in this meal. If you have questions about what we believe in practice here regarding this meal that we call Holy Communion, 
we still invite you to come forward to receive a blessing. Let us know that's what you want to receive by placing your arms across your chest like this. Now we're going to begin serving this meal to those who are serving us this morning, so we invite those people to please come forward. As you await to be invited forward to receive this meal, my suggestion is just spend a few moments in the quiet of your hearts giving God thanks for all that he's given you. Your glory, God. 
There in the newborn cry It's there in the light of every sunrise There in the shadows of this life Your great grace It's there on the mountain top There in the everyday and the Monday There in the sorrow and the dancing Your great grace and such grace From the creation to the cross There from the cross into eternity Your Thank you. 
make the same for the same and for the sinner. It's enough for this whole From the creation to the cross and into eternity, God is reigning right now and his grace is finding us. Amen. Amen. Trust that you have received his grace through this meal and trust that through this meal, he will strengthen your faith into life everlasting. Amen. Let us remain standing and confess who this God is through the words that Christians have been confessing down through the ages, the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue in worship and lifting the praises to God, we take the time to return what he has first given us, and that is through our monetary gifts so that the ministries here at Good Shepherd would reach out into this community and bring more people to know their Savior.
my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a foundation I will put my trust Father, we, we thank you and, and praise you for calling us to be your disciples, to be your witnesses, to shine the light of Jesus Christ in this world, and then the light of our lives, of our goodness and love for you and people. It glorifies you, God. That's why we're here as believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. And part of our responsibility, God, is to give back to you a portion of what you've given us, not because you need our money, but because you want our hearts. And this is our way of saying, God, we love you and we trust you and we want you to use these gifts in a way that only you can to open up the hearts of people who have yet to know Jesus as their Savior. But God, it's not just that that you use, it's us. You've given us gifts as well. So continue to reveal to us the people you put in our lives who need to know that you love them too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, praise team. What do you think of the praise team today, huh? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Justin. My, Justin, you know, I heard that in rehearsal. I thought you guys were just kidding around. I thought, you know, now I'm like, I did not know we were a hard rock church, but I kind of liked it. What'd you think of that, huh? Yeah. You got some gifts. Um, Justin, stick to that. Country Western's okay, but that's better. All right, so... Anyway, uh, it's great to see all of you here today. I want to say a special thank you to some people that are near and dear to me in my life. We have the beaches, Fred and Barbara. David, would you all stand, please? They come all the way, really, originally from Santa Clarita, California. In 1994, when we started Follow the Star, and um, that's Fred and, uh, and, and Barbara and David. Be David lives down in Pflugerville Hill but here, but okay, go have a seat. I just want to say thank you for being here. It's great to see you. And, and, and Barbara... Um, and, and Fred, they actually uh, moved to Prescott, Arizona, and they wanted to show you that any commute is not too long to get here. Okay, so I want to thank them for being here uh, today and brought back some, some good memories. Well, this is our last week in our series called Keep It Simple. All right, it, and um, the reason we started this, this series is because it's just been on my heart, you know, something... I think that we have a tendency to do as Christians, we sometimes take our faith, what we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, who we believe God is and all that, and, and we make it too complicated. And then we, we take that and we transfer that to our life as well. How do we live out the Christian life? And I think we complicate that too, to the point where we don't do it then. We don't live our lives for Jesus as, in a very, very simple way. And so... Um, our first message was just simply uh, called the simple truth. And the idea there is, look, don't listen to the voices out there or even up here in your head. Just trust the voice in here. God alone. Trust in this truth. Keep it simple when you talk to people about the way to salvation. Our second message was the simple prayer. Because, oh my, there are so many different formulas for prayer and people saying you got to pray a certain way, certain kind of words, certain number of words. You got to go in a closet, out of closet, whatever it is. And you know what? God just says, talk to me. 
He invites us and commands us as our Father in heaven to come to Him and talk to Him about the needs in our lives. And what happens is prayer becomes an exercise of our faith. We get stronger on a relationship with Him and we begin to trust in His will for our lives even more than we trust in our own will for our lives. And that's where He wants us to be. And we'll get there when we keep prayer simple. Our third message was called the simple love. How God does not call us to like people. It's hard to like people, isn't it? There are probably some people here today that you don't like. You might be sitting next to somebody you don't like. Don't look at them. But anyway, but he calls us to love them, right? He calls us to love people, to love people as God does. And God loves everybody. And so he calls us to do the same. Now, what God does, though, is he takes people and he breaks them up into two categories. There are people who are inside the church, meaning those who believe in Jesus Christ their Savior. There are people outside the church, meaning those who don't. And what he's saying is, look, do not confront people outside the church, outside of faith in Jesus Christ, with the sin in their life. It's not going to make any sense to them. That's kind of like us saying, you know what, I know you don't believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, but start acting like it anyway, all right? But inside the church, he says, oh no, we need to hold each other accountable for the sin because sin taints our witness in how we give glory to God. That's love. Loving people on the outside, confront them in their unbelief. People on the inside, confront each other in our sin. That's love. And that's how to keep love simple. Now, last week, the message was titled, The Simple Life. And it was about getting people to hear what we have to say about Jesus. The only way they're going to want to hear what you have to say about Jesus is if they want to. Anybody who's been in sales before, you know you don't tell people things about a product, right? You just don't tell them about it because people have a tendency to doubt what you tell them. But rather you ask them questions and then you get them to answer or to ask you questions. And either one of those principles, it works because then they open the door. They give us a foundation to share um, our truth and our love with them. But here's the deal. We have to earn their trust. We have to earn credibility in their eyes. We have to be congruent in who we are, in what we say and how we act. Two important phrases to keep in mind about living the simple life. One that's an old cliche, but it's very, very profound and true. They will, not, they will not care what you know until they know that you care. It's that simple. And the other one is practice living a life that begs the question of why do you have the hope you have? And when they ask you, why do you have the hope you have? You tell them why. Which leads us to our last message in this series titled The Simple tell the simple tell now i brought something with me this morning to help me with my message it's a deck of cards all right how many of you play cards here any play cards how many of you play dominoes okay more people play dominoes than cards here in texas i know that but i love cards i grew up playing cards all the time in fact while most people you know would have like one or two jobs in college i always had two jobs in college right one was a job at a at a corner store in the neighborhood and the other one was playing poker <laughs> well seriously and 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 what i learned was 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 to see the tells of people now a tell in cards in poker is the person holding a hand of cards they are giving clues as to what hand they're holding, all right? How many of you have tells that you know give away what you got in your hands, right? Well, I got really good at, at being able to, to read people that way uh, to see what kind of cards they have. Now, this is not about poker, though, though it, it, it could be. Um, there is this similarity in the tell we give in cards and the tell we give in life. As I said, in poker, the tell is giving clues is the hand you're holding. In life, it's the same. Giving clues is the hand you're holding, meaning why you live the way you do. Now, I'm going to get back to that in a little bit about why that's so important in how we share our faith. But before I do that, I want to share with you a couple stories. Um, the first one that I want to share with you, a very personal story, um, and, and, and some of the things I learned from that story in the next one about how, what, how it formed me in how I witness, how I tell people ab about Jesus Christ in my life. The first story is this. When my son Jacob was 16 years old, he's 32 now. Is he 33? He's at least 32. 
uh, years old. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I fronted some money. We fronted some money for him for a car as a salvage title, so I had to drive it alone for six months to make sure it was safe. It was a little sports car. It was an MR2 Toyota. How many of you ever had a mid-engine um, um, race car, Toyota, you know, four-speed back then and all that? Anyway, it's a, it's a fast little car, and I took him to California, uh, at the Fontana Speedway. Anybody ever been there, Fontana's Speedway? Yeah, good, good. I'm, I'm glad to see that. Uh, that's, a, that's a great racetrack in there. And um, I... My son was the kind of son who I had to get out from behind his studies because he needed to socialize more. And so that's, that's really what was behind all this. And so um, I took him to the, to the racetrack because I wanted him to learn how to respect the car, um, its power, and to learn how to drive safely. Though Those were the reasons. I also figured I'd get a chance to do some racing that day. Um, so... That's why he went. And I did also want to meet his friends because what had happened was because he got the car and then he joined a car club. And so he started to socialize in this car club. Uh, it was mostly people from other countries, especially Asian. Um, and, and they would order these, uh, uh, these parts and engines from, from Tokyo, other places like that. And so it was kind of cool. So I wanted to get to know these guys. So we go to this, uh, this speedway and they're all there between 16 years old and 26 years old approximately Jacob on the young side I, I gotta tell you I was so impressed they were so kind they, they were so clean cut and clean language and and they just had good values and they all in common they just had a common love and respect for good cars and for speed I gotta tell you though I was a little surprised that when I got there everybody already knew what I did for a living they knew I was a pastor and that surprised me because I didn't know my son was proud of that or maybe he felt he had to warn him. I'm not sure, but they all knew that, that I was a pastor. And yet they still talked to me and they respected me. It was, it was really, it was a fun day for me, um, especially after, um, well, see, my son, he would drive around the track and they put out these cones and it's a big, big asphalt track and it was all speed trials. And then he'd go and then and he spun out two times in a row. Obviously that cut into his time and all that. And about... You know, some of the other drivers are doing the same thing. So I said, all right, come on, I'm going to drive it. And he's like, oh, yeah, Dad, sure, sure, sure. So I drove it, just killed him. I mean, they, my speed was so much better than him and over half of the car club. I'm, I'm serious. And he said, how did, you, how did you do that? I said, I grew up in Minnesota driving on ice and snow. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> when you start sliding, and you have to turn into the slide, into the skid, not away from it. And anyway, so uh, that's where I, I earned uh, the nickname of Faster Pastor. We don't use that anymore. But, um, but while they're at the track, <laughs> while at the track, I remember asking myself, okay, they know I'm a pastor, so I'm supposed to act like a pastor. I should be talking about my faith in Jesus Christ. How do I do that? How do I witness to them without sounding cheesy? You know, how do I witness to them without sounding like I'm pushy or, or embarrassing my son or just saying something weird? Like, like, so some thoughts went through my mind, like, well, um, Hey, great time on that run. Don't you think it's time? You know, Jesus, I thought, no, that's not going to work. You know, I'm glad I didn't use that one. And then I, and I thought, well, yeah, they were all spinning out. So I said, man, you spin out again. You could die if you were to die. On your next run, you stand before the gates of heaven, and God will say to you, why should I let you in my kingdom? What would you say? And I said, no, I'm not going to use that one either. I don't think that would work. And, but, I, but I struggled with it, all right? I went through my head. How can I witness to them? I didn't want to, to, to lose the respect from his friends. I didn't want to cause Jacob to be embarrassed. Um, I just felt like I needed to say something to them about Jesus. Have you ever been there? Yeah, I just, I, did, I didn't know how. You know, uh, you know it's, it's like, what if I say the wrong thing? Or what if I say something stupid? You know? How many of you struggle with that when you think about telling someone, like, uh, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I, I don't want to sound cheesy. I don't want to say th something stupid. Those, those kinds of thoughts come to us. Well, so the first thing I learned about, about trying to, to share your faith with someone, trying to tell someone about Jesus, is it's not easy. Especially when you allow doubts... <laughs> to creep into your head and to cause you to, to have those what if questions. What if I did this? What if I did that? Second story. In 1996, I was only a year and a half at this, at this church. I went back to it a year and a half later for the rest of my ministry in California. Uh, but I went up to Northern California, Crescent City. Anybody been to Crescent City? It's where the real redwoods are, 250 inches of rain a year. An awesome place. Um, 
So I served as a pastor up there, and, and I made a visit to a woman in, in a trailer park, which was common up there. Uh, uh, one of the people in the church asked me to visit somebody they knew who didn't believe, who was not a Christian. And so I went into her trailer. It was, it was a rusty, rusty, moldy, leaky, metal shed-like like, like trailer. And she lived on practically nothing. And, and, um, and though I'd had some experience as a pastor, a year and a half as being a pastor, it was still kind of new to me, meeting a stranger in some strange place and talking about God's stuff. And so I, I didn't really know how to get into it. And then it, like an hour went by and we were just having small talk, getting to know each other. And finally, I thought to myself, you know what, I, I better just get into it. So I finally just said, look, I just came here because I wanted you to know that God loves you. Now, up to this moment, this woman had been very kind and, and very meek and, 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 and very mild. And she suddenly lashed out at me. I mean, literally, she screamed at me, how can you say that? How could God love me? Look at where I live. I can't even fix the, the leaks on my roof. I don't have enough food. And you say God loves me? I'm just like, wow, this is, this is tough. And in that instant, I learned something about Christian witnessing I've never forgotten. I learned what a Christian witness is not. A Christian witness is not an answer giver. All right? Is not an answer giver. I couldn't answer that woman's question. Why? Why her husband left her with almost nothing? Why she had a scrounge every day for food and clothing? Why she had to beg the way she did? Why her roof was leaking and she didn't even have money to fix the leaks? I couldn't answer those kinds of questions. But that's not what I was there for. I didn't realize that until after I left, but I realized that the second thing I learned is this. A Christian witness is not a problem solver. I'd have been there for a year trying to solve all of our problems if I was a problem solver, right? I mean, I, I might, might be able to help her take care of a couple things, like provide some food, which I did, and, and, and some clothing, and, and, and maybe even you know, fix the leaky roof, though I'd have to call somebody else in to do that. And I remember what I was thinking, though, at that time, Though it was a verse that came to my mind as these other things are going through my mind. Now, many of us know this verse here because we use it here a lot. It's where we get the phrase, live a life that begs the question. It's 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord, and always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you what? To give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, I want you to note something here about that verse in 1 Peter 3.15. What Peter does not say. He does not say you must always be ready to give an answer to everyone about anything they ask. He does not say give an answer to everybody's questions uh, about religious philosophy or the economic problems in the world, why my stocks are up or stocks are down or why I don't have enough food or why drunks kill, kill, kill people. Uh, you know, why... Um, your roof is leaking. You, you, that's not what he's talking about in that verse. What God is saying through Peter in 1 Peter 3.15, he's saying, be ready to explain why you, in spite of everything you got going in your life, all the trials and tribulations you have going, surgery after surgery after surgery, pointing to Leona. And thank you for your prayers for her. That's why she's here today why you still have hope it's because you have jesus amen i mean that 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 is what it's all about be ready to explain that so that was how i answered the, the lady at this time after she last out to me this is what i said i said something like this i said look i don't know why life is so tough for you but let me tell you what i do when life is tough for me when it's tough for me, I remind myself that no matter what, God made me, and God loves me. And God is the one who gave me faith in Jesus Christ. God is the one who sent his son Jesus Christ to die on that cross to forgive me for my sins. He rose from that grave so that I would always have hope in this life that there's a life after this life, a perfect life where I would be, where there is no more sorrow, there's no more tears, there's no more leaky roofs because heaven doesn't have roofs that leak. No 
Note also here, in this passage from God through Peter, Peter doesn't say, hey, before you tell anyone about the hope you have, you have to know the Bible cover to cover. You have to know every scripture passage. How many of you know every scripture passage in the Bible? Oh, what failures. <laughs> That's what some people make you think. Peter does not say, oh, before you share the hope that you have in Jesus Christ, you have to know every nuance of Christian doctrine and say it just right. How many of you know every nuance of Christian doctrine? Didn't think so. Because no one does. But sometimes that's the kind of stinking thinking we do that holds us back from telling others what we do know about Jesus Christ. What Peter is saying here in this verse is live a life that demonstrates the hope you have in spite of what you're going through. And when someone asks you why you have the hope you have, you point to Jesus. I did that. I did that for this woman. I shared my hope. In Jesus with her, as you heard me just share. So what happened? Well, you're probably thinking you're going to hear about some amazing conversion story here. Because some pastor on some pedestal went to a trailer and just changed somebody's life because I just had the right words to say and so articulate and all that. Right? Well, no, it didn't happen here. That woman did not fall on her knees. And she did not raise her hands and go, I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. She didn't do that. No. You know, you, know what, you know what she did instead? She laughed. That's even wrong to say. She didn't just laugh like a chuckle, like ha ha ha. No, she howled her laughter at me. It was the most howling, derisive laughter I've ever experienced in my life. It was like she's saying, oh, I had such pity on you, you idiot. You're so stupid. You're so ignorant. You're so deluded. All I know is this. When I left there, I felt like an idiot. I felt like a failure. Because this woman gave me no reason to think I'd done anything to lead her to Jesus. Absolutely nothing. In fact, I probably turned her away from Jesus. And that just cut me. That was really, really hard for me. But over time, I came to a third realization as to what a Christian witness is not. A Christian witness is not a converter. It's not up to me, and it's not up to you to convince somebody to believe Jesus is their Savior. That's not how it works. Bringing faith into the hearts of people for Jesus as your Savior, though that is the goal of Christian witnessing, of sharing the story of Jesus, it is not your responsibility or mine. It is not the responsibility of the witness. We plant the seed of faith. God is the one who who grows it. For those of you who were here last night and you listened to Pastor Pradeep Thorat talking about his experience with, with immigrants from all over the world who are coming here and how he leads them to citizenship and, and English, second uh, uh, English classes and so forth and, and educational tours. We might call them bait and switches. He calls it evangelism because he gets them to experience who God is They'd say no if they just said, i got to teach you about Jesus. No, instead, he moves them there in time. Mark 4, 26, 27, this is pretty much what Pradeep said last night. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed in the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know why. What that's about is here's how the kingdom of God works. Followers of Jesus plant seeds of faith in the soil of people's hearts. And then God grows it. It's a mystery because faith is a miracle. Because faith is a gift of God. We plant the seeds. That's what God's calling is on our lives. He will take it from there. Somebody being converted to the Christian faith once the seed is planted, that's between them and God. Do you hear that? 
Don't blame yourself as I blame myself. And it doesn't mean I don't take it hard when I don't see somebody fall on their knees and give thanks to God. But it happens. God changes people, converts people in His own time, in His own way. <laughs> the irony is He still uses people like you and me who don't know every verse in the Bible, who don't know every nuance of Christian doctrine, and who don't always know what to say. So, what's the key then to telling others about the hope you have in Jesus? Well, i got to tell you, so when I was putting this together, I, I started thinking to myself, you can Google this, okay? You can put it in the URL, just, you know, like, uh, how do I tell them about Jesus? And you're going to find countless steps that people will give you. Billy Graham has some, Crew has some, everybody's got all these, these steps. And so I thought, well, I, I could share some of these steps with you. And I first build a relationship with someone. Well, that's a big duh. Standing on the street corner and holding up a Bible and screaming at people, it doesn't work. All right? Build a relationship. That's common. Listen. Oh, we have a hard time listening. You know what happens mostly when we, when we listen to people? Our minds are running with what we're going to say next, and so we're not really listening, are we? Are you there? Do you know what I'm talking about? All right? Listen. Listen to people. Really listen to them. Oh, and here's an even tougher one. Don't judge them. Just love them. Don't judge them. They need love. And probably my biggest pet peeve is this, is when people aren't real, when you're not authentic. Would you please be real? Would you please just be yourself? You do not need to be anybody else. You just need to be you. God made you the way you are and gave you faith in Him because He needs people like you. Just like each and every one of you to go out there and He's going to use you to plant seeds of faith in people's heart. I guess what I'm saying there is, is don't don't use any Christianese talk. Some of the articles, they're going to talk about that. You know what that means? That means you tell somebody, says, well, you know what you need. You need, to get, you need to get washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Like that, I said that lady didn't scream out, right? You know, they're going to think you're a nutcase if you say that. They, really, they have no idea what that means. You're talking about blood? You know? Just be you. Use simple language with people. However, all these steps that you're going to read about, if you do Google, I hope you do, they're all good. They really are. But if you want to keep it, it, it it's simple, really simple, then I have some steps you can follow. And you've heard this before. The first one is don't tell anyone about Jesus. How simple is that? How many of you like that one so far? Okay. Unless they ask, right? But then the question is, how are they going to ask? Right? Right? You need to live, you need to, uh, the challenge is get them to ask, and how do you do that? How do you get people to ask? You live a life that begs the question. That's where that comes from. That's what Peter's talking about in 1 Peter 3 15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. How does that start? Set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. Because when Christ is Lord in your heart, you will live it out. People will see him in you. And they're going to want to know who your God is. Why do you have the hope you have? When you're sick, when you're ill, when somebody just died, when your wife's in the hospital, when the surgery is five hours instead of two. All those things. When you still have joy in your heart, people are going to say, why? And then you point to Jesus. That's what we do. Now, that gets me back to the tell. All right? The tell that we started off this message with. I started off by comparing the tell in poker to the tell in witnessing your faith. Give clues to the hand that you're holding. All right? So when I was putting this message together, I happened to Google that question, you know. What about, how do you tell people... Uh, about Jesus through a deck of cards. And I came upon something, some of you I know are familiar with, it's called a soldier story. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You can Google that and you can see it. It's done a lot better and I'm going to do it. But it works like this. It goes like this. So you have a guy who's in the army and he's in the barracks and his sergeant comes in and he sees his cards all across the table. He says, what you doing there, soldier? He says, I'm spending time with the Lord. He says, doesn't look like it. Looks like you're playing cards. He says, well, let me show you what I mean. Why cards are important in my faith. He says, because when I pull this out, I'm reminded that there's only one God and he is Lord of all. 
And people might talk about there being all kinds of gods, but no, there's only one. There's only one true God. And that true God is revealed in the Bible. You know what the Bible is made up of? The Bible is made up of two divisions, two parts. There's an Old Testament, New Testament, and they both reveal who that God is. They both reveal that that God is made up of three persons, not three gods, but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all one God. Now, if you want to know more about who that God is, especially the second person of that triune God, the three in one God, Jesus Christ, all you got to do is go to the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, because they tell his story. And what you find out when you read the story of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you find out that Jesus was there before time began, began, and he was there at creation. Those six days, he is the Word. And on the seventh day, God rested. And he tells us to rest too, to spend time with our Savior Jesus Christ. And this is why. Because those commandments that God gave us, that we were to keep perfectly so we could be holy in the presence of a holy God and live forever with him without any condemnation, these ten commandments that God, Jesus himself, broke down into one, the law of love, Jesus kept perfectly he did what we could not do for ourselves and that's why the most important card in the deck of cards is the king because jesus is our king and we trust in him as our savior the point of today's message is simply this live your life giving clues to the people god puts in your life of the hand you're holding why do you do what you do? What's your motivation? Why do you love people that maybe that other people don't? Why do you hang around public sinners when you claim to go to church or to be a pastor? Hmm, just like Jesus did. Why do you make the choices you make? What drives you to love everybody that God puts in your life no matter what's going on? And why do you have the hope you have? Why do you have the hope you have, no matter how difficult your life gets? And when you get asked that question, when you live a life that begs that question and people ask you, you can point to the cross and you can say, He is why. He is why. Because let me tell you what He's done for me. He went to that cross to pay the penalty mark for my sins by dying a horrible, shameful death which was required because of sin. He did that for me and because of that I'm forgiven and I also, because of his resurrection from that grave, he did not stay dead but he rose from that grave. I know through my faith in him I am going to rise to and live forever with him. You can even go on for them. And you can tell them all about your personal story and what Jesus has done for you. You don't have to, but you have the right to. And you want to know why you have the right? Because you're not just telling them, you're answering their question. You live the life that begged the question. They said, who is your God? Why do you have the hope you have? And they've given you a platform to tell them just who he is. Now, for some of us, that's still too complicated. That can be still kind of frightening. So there's even a simpler thing you can do. When somebody asks you, why do you have the hope you do? Just point to Jesus. He's the simple tell. Because your salvation and mine has never been simpler. He did it all. And that is what people need to know. In Jesus' name, amen. Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and for your incredible love for us. I want to thank you for last night, God, how you used our time together and, and Pastor Pradeep to be here to share with us the story of how he uses Follow the Star here to bring people to Jesus Christ. God, I just, my heart is so filled with gratitude for what you've given me and all of us and that's your grace 
so much grace. Thank you for loving us, for forgiving us, giving us the gift of the hope of eternal life, but also the gift of your presence in our lives right now today. So that when we are encountering the people you put in our lives and we don't know what to say, we can lean on you. And you'll remind us, just point to Jesus. <laughs> just point to Jesus. The simple tell. That is the tell you want us to tell the world. In his name we pray. Amen. Please join me as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, as I was thinking about how to conclude this message, one of the things that came to mind last night was when Pastor Pradeep said, <laughs> it might take me a year or five years or ten years to, to really get somebody to, to know who Jesus is, especially if they're Muslim, right? I take him to follow the star, and in one hour, they hear the whole story. And I'm thinking to myself, there's a lot of truth in that. What a gift that God has given us. So that's also a simple tell. Just say, like he said, you want to see some animals? <laughs> and then take them and their kids to learn about Jesus Christ. Keep the tell simple. It really is. If you trust that the faith you have in Jesus is all you need, that that's what works for your salvation. Trust also that God has work for you to do. And that the love, the works of love that you show to the people he puts in your lives, God's going to use that to work for their salvation. So as you leave from here today, everybody you see, no coincidences, God's putting those people in your life. May he open up a window of opportunity and may also reveal to the eyes of your heart that they need to hear your tell of who their Savior is. And as you do so, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, smile upon you, and give you the peace that only he can give in Jesus. Why? Because you know faith works. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye. 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 Bye.